Welcome to Mayo Clinic q and I'm Dr. Helena Gazelka. Cervical cancer is a type of cancer that occurs in the cells of the cervix, which is the lower part of the uterus that connects to the vagina. Infection with a human papillomavirus, or HPV as it is known, is the most common cause of cervical cancer. Women can reduce the risk of, of cervical cancer by getting the HPV vaccine and by having routine screening tests to help detect precancerous conditions of the cervix. Here to discuss with us today what women need to know about cervical cancer is Dr. Christina Butler. She is the co-chair of the Gynecologic Disease Group at the Mayo Clinic Cancer Center. Thanks for being here today, Dr. Butler. Thank you for the wonderful invitation. I really appreciate it. Well, we really appreciate you being here with us to talk about this topic that probably doesn't get talked about enough, uh, but certainly uh, important information to, to share with women. Absolutely. As a gynecologic oncologist, it's very near and dear to my heart. We've made huge strides in screening for cervical cancer, and I really look forward to speaking about that today and enhancing education for women. Well, Dr. Butler, how about we start with a softball and have you describe uh, for our listeners, what is the cervix exactly? So the cervix is connected to the uterus and it uh, joins the uterus and cervix with the vagina. Uh, it's visible during an office exam uh, with using a speculum and looking into the vagina, which makes for great opportunity for screening uh, that area for cancer. Unfortunately, cancer may occur at the cervix, and this is something we really want to catch quickly for women. So Dr. Butler, speaking of cervical cancer, are there different types of cervical cancer, or is there really one entity that we're speaking about? There are a couple types. The most common is what we call squamous cell cancer of the cervix, and then uh, after that, we have adenocarcinoma. But essentially, uh, they're treated uh, very similar uh, minor differences, and uh, those make up the majority of uh, the prevalence of cervix cancer. Well, when we start talking about cancer, naturally people want to know, how would I know if I had cervical cancer? What are the symptoms? Yeah, I think it's always important for women to really be attuned to their body. And many women with cervical cancer might have this picked up on a screening pap smear. However, other women might have some abnormal bleeding, so they might have uh, bleeding between their menstrual cycle or uh, bleeding after intercourse. Uh, it's important to seek out medical evaluation if a woman does have abnormal bleeding. Uh, cervical cancer doesn't typically cause pain, but may, and so that would also be important to seek evaluation and just listen to your body. Who is most at risk for cervical cancer? Women at most risk would be those that have been exposed to HPV. So HPV is a human uh, papillomavirus that is quite prevalent and easy to be exposed to with intimate relations uh, and really just normal human behavior. Uh, if you've been exposed to HPV, which the majority of the population has, it certainly puts you at risk for cervical cancer. And as you mentioned, with the HPV vaccination, we have such a beautiful opportunity to have a vaccination against a cancer. Dr. Butler, we're hearing a lot about viruses lately, and they act differently. How is HPV passed from person to person? So HPV is a DNA virus, and it's passed in um, you know, body contact, so intercourse, intimate relations from the genitourinary tract. Um, it can also be found in the oral uh, and throat passages um, from uh, kissing, touching. Uh, it's very easy to transmit, like many other viruses that we're aware of. And a typical robust immune system um, can counteract exposure to that virus. And most people will never have symptoms of HPV. However, some women uh, can develop uh, cancers. The HPV has been associated with uh, cancer of the uh, cervical area, the vagina, the vulva, the anus, and also uh, some throat cancers. You mentioned earlier some of the symptoms, uh, signs or symptoms, such as uh, painless bleeding, perhaps between periods or after sex, and then about um, exams in the office. What else can be done uh, to, be pr to prevent cervical cancer? What does a, what does a good, healthy regimen for self-care in that uh, way look like? Yeah, 
Yeah, so I'm always a big advocate for safe sex, um, using condoms with intercourse and having um, a, you know, a reasonable being mindful of the partners that you are with. Um, high risk multiple sexual partners does put you at an opportunity to be more exposed to the HPV virus. And uh, having your screening exams, uh, listening to your body, there's great opportunity again to get the HPV vaccination for uh, those above the age of nine years and up to age 45, it's FDA approved in the United States for cancer prevention and safety. And what are the guidelines for that, Dr. Butler? Is that vaccine only for uh, females or are men vaccinated as well? Great question. Uh, absolutely men and women together um, should be vaccinated uh, and uh, as well children. So the optimal time Time for vaccination would be prior to HPV exposure. And with normal human behavior, intimate relations, as we age, we typically have those relations. So vaccinating children prior to those exposures is ideal, hopefully in an effort to def eradicate cervical cancer and all of the HPV cancers that I mentioned. You mentioned that the pap smear, which most women would be familiar with uh, as an office procedure, um, is, is a good screening measure for cervical cancer. What are the survival rights when you detect this? Women, uh, if diagnosed in stage one, the five-year survival is actually well over 90%, which is excellent and something that we can detect quickly uh, if we have these screening modalities. And then uh, some women unfortunately are diagnosed with more advanced stages and the survival for those would be, you know, in the range of 50, 65% for five years. What does the treatment look like and is it different for the different stages? Yes, it absolutely is. So when the cancer is more localized, uh, stage one, we're able to treat uh, very often with surgery alone and have excellent outcomes. The more advanced stage, uh, three and four, would be treated with combined modality therapy, with chemotherapy and also radiation treatment. You know, we've been talking a lot uh, this year about healthcare disparities and different populations having access uh, differently, uh, et cetera. Are there healthcare disparities that are related to uh, cervical cancer that women should be aware of? There absolutely are. So we do see, unfortunately, uh, more uh, incidents in our uh, socioeconomically uh, challenged patients or uh, those of uh, Latino, uh, African-American descent uh, for reasons that aren't completely clear. And so I think it's most important actually that we highlight the opportunity for education for all women, young and old, uh, of all ethnicities to seek screening, make that screening available to women, make it uh, accessible to the location that they reside so that it's convenient and that the care is not delayed in any way. Dr. Butler, as a gynecologic oncologist, you obviously see a women uh, at all stages of life and at all stages uh, of management of cervical cancer. How does it typically affect um, quality of life for women who are diagnosed? The quality of life can definitely be impacted. Um, cancer is a, a huge uh, stressor, not only to a woman, but her entire family. The treatment um, can be difficult, and it's important to have a care team that's very supportive uh, along the way. The um, chemotherapy, radiation can have side effects. Uh, this can make it uh, cause pain for the woman. Uh, and also, I would say um, sexual function uh, can be impacted. Uh, a woman's uh, level of anxiety, depression, it's a huge impact surviving a cancer and maintaining strength. So it's good to have excellent support for treatment. And a major stressor can be, am I receiving the right kind of care that I should be receiving? How would a woman know if she is receiving adequate, appropriate, or you know, up to up to date care regarding cervical cancer? So at Mayo Clinic, we are committed to evidence based practice. Uh, I think it's ideal to follow national guidelines. The National Comprehensive Cancer Network is an excellent resource, and Mayo Clinic supports that uh, institution in, in creating their guidelines. We're also a National Cancer Institute uh, designated facility. 
in our commitment to provide uh, best practice care for women. We're actively involved in clinical trials. And I think it's also very important to, to uh, have a relationship with your provider. Pick someone that uh, you're very comfortable with and that you can ask questions, receive answers, uh, and also support through your treatment. You mentioned a little bit about what Mayo Clinic might offer. Do, does Mayo Clinic offer any uh, unique kinds of treatments or opportunities for women who are diagnosed with cervical cancer? Well, we're huge advocates for the HPV vaccination. I know I've said that a few times, uh, but in addition to that, uh, maintaining commitment to uh, best practice guidelines, uh, clinical trials, as I mentioned, cutting edge therapies for patients with cervical cancer, and then there are uh, unique opportunities as well in our chemotherapy practice for targeted treatments for women and also um, intraoperative radiation therapy, which is something we can use in a recurrent setting for very targeted treatment uh, for women and excellent uh, results. Are our screening guidelines at Mayo Clinic any different than wh what you've mentioned in the national guidelines? Not that I'm aware of. We, uh, our screening guidelines for women with pap smear, uh, we do follow national guidelines. And we're always, again, uh, staying up to date with this management uh, strategies. So each year the guidelines are updated and do you know, uh, adjust as we move forward with new knowledge and education. Um, That's great. Thank you, Dr. Butler, for sharing with us today. Absolutely, my pleasure. Such a great opportunity. And um, celebrating Cervical Cancer Awareness Month is a great uh, opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you for helping us to get information out there. Our thanks to Mayo Clinic gynecologic oncologist, Dr. Christina Butler, for being with us today to educate us about cervical cancer. Remember that it's Cervical Cancer Awareness Month in January. And so we hope that you are getting your appropriate screenings and heed Dr. Butler's advice regarding the HPV vaccine. Thanks so much for listening in today. I hope that you learned something. I know that I did. We wish you a wonderful day. Mayo Clinic Q&A is a production of the Mayo Clinic News Network and is available wherever you get and subscribe to your favorite podcasts. To see a list of all Mayo Clinic podcasts, visit newsnetwork.mayoclinic.org. Then click on podcasts. Thanks for listening and be well.